Hello, and welcome to the first of a three-part series from the Institute for Humanities Research on Hope and Empowerment. I'm Liz Grumbach. I'm the Assistant Director for the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's event in the series. This IHR scholarly series on hope and empowerment is a monthly virtual conversation dedicated to showcasing emerging humanities scholarship on community and identity. Through the lens of hope and empowerment, this series will explore how personal experience shapes scholarship and how, in turn, scholarship informs practice. It's been a process of collective thought and healing to organize this series with my colleagues at IHR. The past six months, this pandemic have highlighted the injustices, inequalities, and tensions that have always existed in our society and in our profession. And our intention is to foster conversation that generates ways of moving forward through our professional and personal lives that is attendant to the needs of our communities and the histories of our communities so that we can create better futures together. I'd like to start by especially thanking our speaker today, Dr. Kevin Winstead, who will be presenting his work on renewal and movement continuity of the Movement for Black Lives. I'd also like to thank our moderators today, Lauren Whitby, IHR Communications Specialist, and Selena Asuna, IHR Coordinator. This event wouldn't be possible without their intellectual and technical expertise. I'd also like to thank Joseph Carter of Livestream Success, who is running our streams today expertly. As a brief note to everyone watching, thank you for joining the conversation. You may have noticed that chat has been disabled in the Zoom webinar. Please ask a question for our speaker at any time using the Q&A function on the bottom of the Zoom window, or if you're watching our YouTube stream by commenting directly on YouTube, and our moderators will relay that to our host today. But before I pass along the mic, this is a gentle reminder for anyone in our ASU community that might be watching. IHR offers seed grant opportunities each semester and our fall 2020 deadline is October 9th. If you have any questions about seed grants, please contact us at IHR at ASU.edu. And finally, we're so grateful to Sarah Florini, who is my faculty co-host for today's event. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Dr. Filarini is an assistant professor of film and media studies in the Department of English at Arizona State University. Her research explores the intersections of Black American cultural practices and emerging technologies. And I'll hand the mic over to you now, Sarah. Dr. Winstead, it's so good to have you here. Thank you both for being here with the Institute for Humanities Research today. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, when Liz contacted me and said, would you, when Kevin gives his speech, who gives his talk, would you like to? And I said, yes, whatever it is, yes. Um, because I'm just thrilled to have him here with us. And I um, really appreciate you all tuning in. So just a brief introduction of, of Kevin Winstead. Dr. Winstead has his PhD in American studies from the University of Maryland. He's currently a CLEAR postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Black Digital Studies at Penn State University. Before that, he was the project manager for the Andrew W. Mellon funded African American Digital Humanities Project at the University of Maryland. He was part of the core team of that first three year cycle that really uh, was a groundbreaking project. Uh, his own personal research beyond those projects focuses on social movements, digital studies, religion, the social construction of knowledge, and digital disinformation. His work has appeared in journals such as Ethnic and Racial Studies and Sociological Compass, as well as multiple edited collections. Uh, Kevin Winstead is truly an interdisciplinary scholar. His work brings together the best of critical digital studies, digital humanities, black studies, and sociology. And in a moment when a lot of people are interested in black social movements, particularly the digital components of those movements, uh, his work is really exemplary for the sophisticated ways that it brings together both on and offline contexts. His deep and sustained engagement with activist communities, everyone from Catholic nuns in Baltimore to on the ground activists in Ferguson has really produced vital insights into our contemporary moment. And he is literally always the first person that I wanna to talk to when I need to understand what's happening in our world. Um, and he's also someone that I'm very grateful to call my friend. And so thank you for being here, Kevin. And I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, well, thanks, Sarah. Um, let me share this now. Okay, 
share screen. And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, I have to be honest with everyone. Um, well, first, let me let me thank uh, the Institute for Humanities Research at Arizona State for the invitation. Um, I'm deeply honored to be a part of this series um, and to thank uh, all of the staff there, to thank my dear friend and colleague, Sarah Florini, um, who uh, oftentimes pushes me when I'm not feeling very motivated, uh, just kind of absorbing the world. Um, and I would also like to thank the, uh, the audience, both on campus, um, on our Zoom here, and our audience on, on YouTube uh, for being in community uh, with us today. Um, to be completely honest with you, my emotions are very um, mixed. I'm of two minds today. There's a part of me that would like to be anywhere but here, um, just absorbing the, uh, the news from the last couple of days, thinking around the uh, city of Louisville. I have family in Louisville and uh, the family of Breonna Taylor. Um, there's a large part of me that uh, I think this tweet that we have up right now kind of captures where I I'm at. I'm not feeling very inspired. Um, I'm not feeling like a source of inspiration. And to be quite honest, I'm feeling a tad bit hopeless. Um, but at the same time, I do feel an obligation uh, to present this work and to continue to do this work. Um, I very deeply believe in the institutions of resistance and in the power of Black cultural production. So that leads me to believe that this moment that I'm feeling will also pass and in its place will eventually be a source of hope and joy. So let me move forward. Okay. Since the first Africans found their way to the United States, Black people have often channeled their expressive culture and available technologies to develop and maintain methods for political communication in public space. These methods are used during political mobilization as well as periods of abeyance. As Robert Ferris Thompson notes of the West African expression of the cool, Black cultural expression privileges the capacity to be nonchalant at the right moment while being able to demonstrate control of political and social pressure. Black activism on Twitter continues this tradition by utilizing collective action frames and manipulation of Twitter's discursive style to capitalize on the political value of the gaze generated from hashtag and trending topics. As the first born digital black political movement, the movement for survival in the era of Black Lives Matter carries on this cultural practice of signifying uh, quoting our colleague here, Sarah Florini, uh, synonymous with Tom Thompson's concept of the cool, signifying draws upon cultural resources to engage social media platforms, specifically Facebook and Twitter, to enact a performance of metaphorical play, vagueness, and duality of meanings produced simultaneously to communicate. So in this research, I ask, what is the role and function of hope in the age of Black Lives Matter? In answering this question, I explore how do Black activists conceptualize hope? Uh, how do Black activists use Twitter to communicate these ideas of hope and survival? How does the practice of conceptualizing and building hope collectively over social media connect to offline activism? And how does Black activist online cultural practice contribute to the continuity of Black social movements. In what follows, I apply an adaptation of critical technocultural discourse analysis, originally articulated by Andre Brock, to argue that African American activists use signifying practices to communicate emancipatory hope. Emancipatory hope as a phrase comes out of Black theology, where theologian Evelyn L. Parker writes, it's the utopian expectation that the forms of hegemonic relations, race, class, and gender dominance will be toppled, and to have emancipatory hope is to acknowledge one's personal agency and God's vision for human equality. During periods of social movement abeyance, like the one I believe that uh, this movement has already experienced, I suggest Black social movement actors use this framework of emancipatory hope to pass knowledge from one period of movement visibility to the next. 
I examine activists' constructions and applications of hope through shared artifacts of political engagement across Twitter and physical space. So on average, I collected about uh, 2,800 tweets per user due to the restrictions placed on Twitter's API on data collection. I began with a propulsive snowball sampling of known activists and activist organizations and found their members and ally organizations through official websites and Twitter follows. Give a little back backstory. Um, so the hashtag Black Lives Matter was created by uh, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi as a call to action after 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was killed and then found legally responsible for his own death in the acquittal of George Zimmerman. Black Lives Matter has grown from a hashtag to an ideological and political intervention in response to ongoing violence against Black lives at the hands of the state and private citizens backed by the state. At its height, Black Lives Matter has grown into a chapter-based global network whose mission is to build local power and to intervene in, in violence inflicted on Black communities by the state and vigilantes. It's also important to note that they weren't the only organization to spawn out of that moment, right? That uh, other organizations were founded about around the same time and uh, they were very much in competition. Well, let me not say competition. They were certainly, I don't mean it in a, in a kind of a capitalist mindset. I mean that they, there was a, a tension on who was going to have the controlling narrative coming out of this moment. Um, and from there, it's also important to note that uh, those organizations, about 28 organizations and 89 affiliate organizations came together in uh, July of 2015 in the wake of Tamir Rice's shooting at the hands of police to form the Movement for Black Lives, which uh, came together to create a six-point policy platform in addition to uh, a hub to share resources and strategies. In order to conduct this research, I, uh, I grind my work within social movement continuity theory while drawing upon the frame alignment process, as I'll explain a little bit later. Continuity theory argues a persistence of social movements during times that are antagonistic to mobilization. The theory connects multiple errors of activism through identifying certain abeyance processes. Abeyance depicts a holding process by which movements sustain themselves and provide continuity from one stage of mobilization to another. As a movement loses support, activists who have been most intensely committed to its aims become increasingly marginal and socially isolated. Abeyance structures then emerge to absorb the committed activists remaining. These structures both restrain them from disruptive activities and channel them into particular forms of activism. I argue that the movement for Black Lives has already experienced a period of abeyance um, directly tied to the uh, administrate to the to the presidential administration. We just don't find uh, periods of high activism during long sustained moments of tyranny. Factors that contribute to abeyance are both external and internal to the movement. The external factors include uh, the movement's relationship to the political elite or non-receptive political elite, um, social capital and in, in, uh, the social capital invested in, uh, in the activist identity. Um, moving toward the internal factors, we are looking at uh, the temporality, the length of time an organization is able to hold its people committed to their values. Um, commitment, the level of commitment one has to the ideas, beliefs, goals, and tactics of the movement. Uh, exclusiveness. So this is where it gets uh, particularly interesting, right? So we're talking about movements when at times where it's not particularly popular to do them, right? So we're talking around uh, the policing of, of, of members to those who have strong levels of that commitment. Um, centralization is really thinking around kind of organizational structures. So uh, in historically speaking, movements that are able to survive that level of hostility are often led by charismatic leadership. And I think that's also true here, even though this, or, this movement is also often looked at as a decentralized movement. 
And then the last one is culture. So uh, embody what culture is really meaning here, embodied in its co uh, collective emotions, beliefs, action making, and uh, just other activity that makes movement work more attractive. Uh, here, organizations carry out alternative cultural frameworks to provide meaning to the marginalized. Um, it's interesting to think around this if we if you've ever heard of kind of the feminist wave metaphor. So we talk oftentimes we think about feminist uh, feminist movements in kind of the first wave, second wave kind of model. A lot of what my work here is trying to do is often expand that model. So if we don't think about the wave in kind of a 2D dimensions, if we think about it in more three dimensions as we, as we include things like intersectionality to the framework. Um, so, uh, what one of the things uh, one of the interviews that helped uh, reaffirm for me that we did go through a period of abeyance is I spoke with a ground leader in D.C. around uh, the movement, and this is what she had to say. When I first joined the movement, it was about risk. What was I willing to risk in support of another community? I think that because there were about 2,000 protests in the names of Black Lives Matter in the span of two or three years, we had our mass protest moment. Because of that, I think that my focus has sh shifted to commitment. It focuses in on commitment and builds relationships and also about governance. What does that look like? We spent a lot of time moving into making sure we know what we're fighting for and not just what we're fighting against and building that out and having strategies to get there. Now my focus is, well, how do we even level up? How do we leverage that a new type of power? So some of the, the key words that were, that were here for me was this focus towards commitment, right? Um, and as she's thinking around uh, uh, governance, it's really about policing a, a, the diversity of agenda because in this moment of high hostility, you really need to focus in on a major point or two that's going to be able to sustain you through the long haul, right? So to understand movement culture, I bring us back to the theoretical framework of Hunt et al's work on framing process and the social construction of movement identities. The frame alignment process is the linkage of individual and collective interpret orientations such that some individual interests, values, beliefs, collective activities, goals, and ideology are harmonious. Under this framework, the framing process plus movement identities come together to accomplish movement goals. Under the framing, pro, uh, the framing task, we see the diagnostic framing for the identification of a problem and the assignment of blame, right? Uh, we also see a prognostic framing to suggest solutions and strategies, tactics to a problem. And we also see this motivational framing, right? The, the, the words that galvanize people to, to do a thing. And all of this comes together along with the assignment of movement identities, right? So we definitely hold up our protagonist figures that help do the work of, of organizing people into this movement space, into the, into the uh, ideology. We also see people assigned as antagonists. And then there's this third field of neutral people, people who often see themselves as not necessarily a part of the movement, but certainly have a place to play as we think around uh, election times, right? And this comes together to produce movement goals. There's really only two types of movement goals. The, um, the ability to create consensus, have everyone agree on a particular topic, and to actually get them to transition into action. Um, my methods to this, uh, to this project really focuses on how to think around critical technocultural discourse analysis on a, on a larger scale. Uh, an argument I have with his, uh, with his founder, Andre Brock, is whether or not this is even possible. Uh, I argue that it is. He argues that it's not. If he's in the question and answer, I'm sure he's going to bring this up. Um, but to do this, I implore a uh, method triangulation. So I use the, the, the CTDA with machine learning techniques, but I place this in conversation with interviews conducted over a two-year period uh, in Washington, D.C., and also participant observation with a few campaigns uh, over that length of time as well. I want to speak to uh, a few of these campaigns really quickly. 
So the NEAR Act is the Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act of 2016, which sought to use public health approaches to prevent violence and reduce incarceration. Started as a community-led critique over policing and the funding structures which encouraged militarization in local neighborhoods. And then the In Money Bail campaign, which is uh, uh, ultimately comes out of uh, a network of organizations, but primarily I followed around the uh, Color of Change organization. It was part of a greater movement to end the in money uh, to end the money bill system, and also even feeds into the abolish police kind of campaigns that we see today. So with this research, uh, I targeted specifically black women in the study because they're overrepresented both in social media activism and in Black Lives Matter organizing. I asked them not only how they use social media, but also why, asking why they joined the movement, do they identify as an activist or an organ organizer, what inspires them to continue in this work, how do they manage things like self-care, and what makes them hopeful? I also ask them, what mistakes are you trying to avoid in the future? To understand the culture of the movement for Black Lives is in part to understand the online discourse of the movement and everyday people who engage it. To do so, I, I do draw on uh, CTDA, which is a methodological approach for the study of digital phenomenon that integrates an analysis of the technocultural artifact, in this case, Twitter, and uses discourse framed through a cultural theory, such as critical race theory. By engaging both the interface of Twitter, its uses, and significant cultural practices, along with a content analysis of Black activist online discussion, I identify the political framing of the current movement for Black lives. CTDA affords the analysis of both Black activist content of Twitter and an analysis of how the structures and services of Twitter contribute to the content generated within this platform. So with that being said, we have to discuss something that we think we all know, right? What is Twitter? Uh, Twitter is known as a microblog, a blogging site. Twitter is the brainchild of programmers Jack Dorsey, Evan Williams, and Biz Stone, who worked at the podcasting company Odeo in San Francisco, and was designed as a way to send texts on their cell phones. Interestingly, Twitter was never designed as a political cultural phenomenon that has become. They settled on Twitter as a dictionary definition of Twitter is as Twitter is consist is considered a short burst of inconsequential information. Founder Jack says that uh, says that was a perfect name because that's exactly what the product was, assuming that their product was culturally neutral. However, looking at the work of people such as Kimberly Esco, Andre Brock, we know black cultural production is overrepresented on Twitter due to what Brock argues is black culture's ability to go beyond the affordances and discourse conventions of Twitter as service. Its minimal interface and SMS text message accessibility allows for a malleability that maps well onto the performativity, signifying, and publicness, producing an unexpected social cultural element to the service. But also keep in mind challenging the work of people such as our own Sarah Florini, uh, Catherine Steele, Heidi Campbell, Oren Golan. We shouldn't talk about any of these pl platforms in isolation, right? That we should be talking about the ecosystem uh, of these platforms. However, within the scope of this particular work, um, it was important for me to capture this space here first. As I continue to develop this work, I'm going to broaden it out and see how these conversations flow from one space to the other, right? Uh, getting into the machine learning aspects of this a little bit. So I start with using uh, pattern-based auto-coding schemes, taking the uh, machine learning algorithms that's found within InVivo to look for existing coding patterns and nodes that I previously coded into my project. And then I filter through different levels of generalization. So what does that mean? That means, you, as you see the screen here, we have the word hope, but I also have to pro pro uh, program it for the the kind of the suffixes that happens on there so hopeful hopelessness um and then i also code it to a second point within a statement in, in in the syntax so and a lot of these tweets here that's in front of us i search for like hope and trump uh and see just kind of get a general understanding of what how this conversation is playing out um this kind of uh statement tree here this inquiry tree 
you have to imagine uh the at the this on the size of a like a classroom roll right there's the th hundreds hundreds of thousands of tweets that look just like this so what did we find um so about 20 percent of those tweets captured were often used to des describe the problem right if we're thinking around those framing tasks about half of the tweets were actually providing solutions to said problem and another 30 percent were call to action but in addition to the literature i found that this frame also was used for more general forms of love and care as i moved into my findings early on i realized that my initial uh, theoretical frame using the frame alignment process of social construction of movement identities needed adjusting as most social movement scholars were studying movements in these peak mobilization moments when they're highly visible and super popular. That is when, that's when movements are, are, are actually most visible. However, what does this process look like for movements that are in bands or in other words, not an environment for this peak mobilization? I was surprised to see the antagonist field represented so frequently, as we notice here, it's about 60%, until I impacted to find that oftentimes the antagonist was uh, the, the current president. So to draw out some of these tweets to kind of give you a look at what, what I'm seeing, uh, here we have a tweet that represents both the hope and uh, antagonist field. Uh, excuse me, it, it, it uh, represents the, uh, the, the antagonist field. Here we see both uh, motivational framing, prognostic and antagonist framing, whereas research has often noted this combination in times where mobilization is more socially acceptable by political and social elites. Here we see this combination used primarily as an act of self and collective care. It is here in this consistent practice of care and criticality that I discovered this concept of emancipatory hope. And let me read this tweet for you. Um, yes, Trump and the Republican Party is triggering as fuck for black people. I say this to say that black people, we have power. Nobody is going to save us but us. I love black people. Hashtag let's get free. In this next set of tweets, we also see the antagonist feel uh, come up again, right? Um, in the first tweet, it says, 80% did not vote for Trump. We can build a rebellion, a sanctuary. Rebellions are bent, built on hope. Hashtag grow the resistance. And the next tweet says, uh, what gives me hope, but equals all over organizing to do what Trump won't. Make Puerto Rico great again. Sustainable, just, free. So we see in both of these that yes, Trump is is part of the of the tweet, but it's not the organ. It's not the point, right? That yes, he's he's there. We know that there's this, this this fixture point that we have to organize against. But at the same time, the the hope is found in each other, right? The hope is found in this in these in these acts of love. In contrast, I also found the protagonist, motivational, and prognostic fields often overlay with each other. What both of these tweets have in common is this call to action focused more generally as the focus of the movement has shifted to local politics and sustaining itself through an author authoritarian government. Um, I'm going to read this one as well. Meaningful change isn't easy. It takes work, struggle, and sacrifice. Ask Mama Harriet. Brother Malcolm, Miss Hamer, Fundi, Huey, Asada, and all of our political prisoners. Not easy and so worth it. Hashtag force change, hashtag do the work, hashtag let's get free, right? So if we think around again, that uh, protagonist framing, what's interesting here is not all of the protagonists are actual uh, living people doing the work at the moment, right? That we're drawing on kind of these historical figures as models for us to shape ourselves behind. So in this way, we're also communicating how to be, you know, quote unquote, an appropriate and a, an effective leader, right? An effective activist. Moving into the participant observation portions of this. So I followed around the In Money Bill uh, campaign around the, the primarily on the East Coast and into the South, specifically the, um, the focus being on uh, getting single mothers out of jail 
uh, paying their bills. So a lot of this, uh, the campaign events here were fundraising opportunities to uh, raise the resources necessary to uh, bail mothers out of jail. Uh, in particular, this one event was part of the Black Love Series campaign, and I was able to uh, get permission to get uh, to show you their their worksheet. Um, and in this particular worksheet, they were using this to help the actual the individual people move from a position of emotion to actually strategizing on how to uh, uh, to create their own campaigns and they could to further this work and to move them from spectator to agent, right? Um, reading off of this sheet, uh, it's asking us to think around 10 people in our network that we would like to have dinner with, right? Um, where will we like to have dinner? What will we, uh, what will we present there? Or what restaurant will we attend? Uh, who will we trust to help us do this work? Um, and then what attendance goals would you set at dinner? And then when you come together, what's on that agenda, right? So it moves from a position of love to action, right? And the second sheet that they had was really having us to interrogate what, what love meant to us, right? So what does black love mean to you? Uh, what songs and, and uh, embody that feeling, that sensation that you have? Uh, what do you currently see black love? Man how do you see it manifest in this area? And what we, can we do to continue to promote uh, black love within the black community? So we see this direct relationship between love, hope, and action, right? So I, I see hope in movements is a um, under theorized concept that I believe has implications for how we understand the how and why individuals mobilize into and sustain their collective action. That is particularly true for movements like Black Lives Matter that face this hostile political climate in the face of, of a tyrant president. Um, I asked another uh, South DC activist how they define hope, and they said that hope is a possibility. Hope is confidence and bravery, because to have hope, it's always to hope. Being a Black activist, hope is in spite of everything that we've seen and everything that we endure. For me, hope is bravery. Hope is seeing young people dance at a protest. Hope is singing and catching the beat in the middle of the street, where there are all police surrounding you. That is hope, because joy and possibility in spite of oppression, right? So there's this direct linkage in her mind between play, joy, love, hope, and action that I think we really need to interrogate, right? So when we ask ourselves, well, how do movements slow down or how do movements dissipate? We really need to go into the activities that, we, that the activists use to generate hope as this resource. My own findings of hope is that hope is, is critical of power. Hope is constructed from both internal and external stimulus. Hope has this element of Sankofa to it, right? And Sankofa is this term coming out of, 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 of Africana studies that ultimately means to go back and fetch what you forgot, right? So it's this way that we channel in our own histories to present uh, solutions for today. Uh, hope becomes this vehicle by which African Americans pass along the strategies and tactics for liberation, both spatially and generationally. But it's also in this play that allows us to, to, to spread these, the, these strategies and tactics in public outside of the gaze that comes with, with, with the public square. Consistent with Black feminist political thought, I find that not only is the personal political, but so is hope. That it can serve as a framing vehicle by which strategies, tactics, and emotional toolkits can be passed to one another in the public gaze. This study adds to social movement uh, research by considering the role that digital plays in advanced formation, and also the role of emotion in the continuity of movements. Uh, the study demonstrates how online space can recenter discourse framing research and act as a catalyst for collective identity formation and maintenance. Or as the, the Media for Justice put, puts it, while they're out here mining data, we're out here mining hope, right? Um, and I will leave you with this. It's a tweet that uh, I found just yesterday as I was processing how I was going to find the energy uh, to be here with you all. And simply put, 
uh, as as Jaya says here, uh, black women, I love you. Um, I was not able to see m many moments of hope, but I did see those strands that eventually could be hope for tomorrow. Thank you. So I'm going to stop there and hit the stop button. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that so much. Um, and I also, I do want to really recognize that this is a weird, chaotic, and taxing time. So I appreciate that you are here with us and did find that energy. Um, there's a question in the Q&A, and I want to encourage everyone to submit your questions to the Q&A, uh, because if you don't, I'm just going to make Kevin talk to me uh, and ask him all of the questions that I have. Um, but there is one here that's about sort of the importance of self-care and social movements, and given that social movements are often predicated on struggle, and yet self-care is important, right? That's the framework. Um, uh, the question asks, what is your experience of the role of joy in digital spaces? And what is the correlation between joy and hope? You started to get into it a little bit at the end, but I was wondering yeah. if you had more to say. The role of joy and hope. Yeah, so uh, I, I would say in kind of these internal conversations sometimes, particularly in academic spaces, there's this tension that uh, I often see in how people try to define blackness, right? I, I, I've, I've participated in some of those debates where we have a segment of the community that's unbothered by like the state and how the state defines blackness. And then there's this other portion that is unbothered by that. What they really would like to focus on is the, the ways that they show up for each other, the joy that happens on an everyday level. And I, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with that tension, right? That um, that the relationship between joy and hope, that joy is this thing that happens on an everyday, on an everyday nature that may be aware of what's going on and may be absolutely be unbothered by it. Um, one of the most interesting things as we think around kind of where these networks come from, a lot of these activist spaces started out as conversations around like scandal on ABC, right? because everyone was enjoying that and we were enjoying each other's company and it was completely unbothered by whatever was going on in the world at the moment. This was absolutely an escape. However, as times, as things happen and, China, and times change, it's these exact same networks that get activated into action, right? So before you're an activist, you're a human being. And I think that 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 space to continue to play, to laugh and joke, while it's not always there, right? There are these moments where trauma happens and you see these 48 hour periods, these week long periods where no one is joking, right? Anyone who studies black Twitter knows it's a very joking space, right? That even serious commentary is happening through jokes. Um, and there's these moments where no one is joking, no one is there yet, but before we get to these moments of like activist hope, we see the jokes come back. We see the play come back. And the, the targets of that ire become the, 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 the focus of these jokes. But the jokes then allow us the space to then create, to strategize, right? It becomes the, the fuel that then eventually becomes that hope. Uh-oh, Andre's in the Q&A. <laughs> no, Andre, don't do it. Uh -uh. Uh, his question is, what is your favorite color? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know he's not going to ask a simple question. Um, no, he's not going to. What is the efficacy of social media for movements like Black Lives Matter when it's only the appearance of Black bodies at protests that seem to cause change? Andre, Andre, okay. So, I mean, there is that element, right? But that element has, has been a part of activism, I think, from jump. There's no era of, of, of kind of black resistance and insurgency that it, it does not have this uh, balance that it has to strike with um, how much uh, pain and violence is, is, is shown. However, I disagree here that only the appearance of 
black bodies um spark this change right if you look at images of seattle right now you very rarely see black people in it like it's um certainly there are these moments where that is true but there are these other moments where people have taken that uh that energy and spirit and tried to figure out for the best of their abilities you know how to how to channel that now granted doesn't mean they always get that right and that needs to be acknowledged but uh i don't think we can just outright dismiss that and you know sort of on that same um same thing like thinking about seattle portland thinking about some of these places um where there aren't a lot of black bodies in the, these crowds right mm -hmm. and i'm really i've been wanting to talk to you about sort of your understanding of this moment because based on what we've seen before and based on your previous work we should still be in this moments of abeyance right that that trump is you know, he just is trying to like outlaw critical race theory and you can't talk about white privilege and all of those things. It's a very repressive moment. And yet we're seeing these uprisings. And so I'm sort of, but the uprisings, the uprisings are not just black folks, yes. right? That they're, they're sort of a different shape and texture and form. Uh, and so I'm interested in sort of what do you think is happening now in terms of, of these cycles? Yeah, that's a great question. So the last, uh, how long have we been in COVID now? Six months? Is that yeah. about right? Yeah. I've been asking myself why, you know, where's, where is this coming from? The scholarship doesn't really answer the moment that we're in within the last six months. And I think COVID is definitely part of it, right? I mean, everybody being at home and angry and frustrated and scared and having that, um, you know, luxury is not the right word, but like everyone is, there's a lot of people at home trying to figure out uh, their human condition. I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I think uh, certainly um, we see this in other, other spaces as well. If we look at athletes, you know, they were able to uh, apply pressure to uh, capitalist structures who were very feeling very much vulnerable as, ev as everyone else, right? So, um, I think that contributes to it. I also think uh, you typically do see an uptick in movement activity as we get closer to elections, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you know, as a kind of uh, intellectual exercise, what this would have looked like maybe a year or two ago, right in the middle of kind of the middle of Trump's presidency. I don't know. Um, but I think we're at one of those moments where people have a goal in mind um, to be hopeful about um to organize around um and quite frankly you know uh there is a direct relationship between uh employment and activism right uh you you know we there's a there's my uh conversations i've had in barbershops and with my father we say all the time that the thing that killed the civil rights movement uh was that everybody got jobs right so like um there is that that level that that relationship there as well Um, those of you who are watching, please do submit your questions via Q&A, or else I am going to just keep talking to Kevin and making you all watch us. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I mean, I also am thinking about, right, I, your work around hope and the ways that you know, for the movement for Black Lives, for this contemporary movement, um, you know, we're several years in. That movement has been happening. It sort of had its crest around Ferguson and Baltimore, then kind of uh, abeyance. And now um, we're seeing another crest, but the demographics are different. And so, and the, so I'm wondering, like, on the folks on the ground, I'm wondering if, um, if some of those folks who started in 2015 and started in 2014, um, those people who said it was about risk and now it's about governance, now it's about sustainability, are they still in that mode or have they switched back to risk mode? I guess what I'm asking is like, are we just seeing a new crest of people that will eventually move out of risk mode back into that other mode? That local yeah, mode? yeah, that's a great question. 
much. And so the thing that is really interesting to kind of ponder is the length of time that these movements are able to, to capture attention, right? Um, if we think around uh, the civil rights movement, most popular understandings of the civil rights movement is maybe like a 10 to 15 year period. Um, those who have the sophistication to separate out civil rights from the black power era, you know, now we're talking around black power, maybe having a, a, a five to 10 year kind of life cycle span in people's minds, right? Um, black Lives Matter as a movement is starting to become one of the longest kind of sustained periods of black er uh, uh, insurgency, at least from the standpoint of how history will remember this moment, right? Um, I, uh, I argue that um, it's not really accurate to see this as one whole sustained timeline and more of two phases, right? There was this first phase under Obama's leadership that looked a particular way that those people there who started were somewhere probably between 18 and 25, 18 and 30, versus uh, this second wave, you have brand new college kids who are themselves somewhere between 18 and 25. Um, we have to absolutely acknowledge the role that uh, campus organizing plays in kind of the, the sustainability of this movement. Um, and yeah, there are absolutely kind of, and not generations, generations is too broad of a term as Andre tends to yell at me about, but um, there is this kind of uh, the old heads and the new incoming and that tension that I think is healthy, right? Um, the, uh, young people tend to, I just said young people, that's crazy, but uh, <laughs> younger activists tend to hold, uh, hold the movement to its core values in a particular way where uh, older activists have the tendency to understand uh, timing a little bit better, right? That they, they understand you know, we've been through this. Is this the particular right tactic? We felt what that we we paid that cost already. Are we sure that this is the right method? It very well may be, but to have someone come in there and second guess that, I think that tension is 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 uh, is, is healthy. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, there's a, I've got two questions now. Uh, this one from came in while we were talking uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and the question is, can you comment on the intersectional qualities of the movement um, and its analysis on issues like economic inequality, ecological issues, those sorts of things? Yeah, that's a good, good, good place to go. Um, before we get to any of the kind of the the subject matter and uh, intersectionality, I think it's important to see how intersectionality is influencing how we think around movements. Um, there was a point in time where, uh, and this is something that was very much been a sites of contention, longstanding contention now within feminist scholarship on how we cast these these kind of first wave, second wave movements. And it's always been organized around like white activity, right? So as we add, as we add uh, different bodies to that space, what we see is that the timeline that we've constructed, that, that wave happened in a particular decade, in a particular era, actually is a lot more complicated, right? Where maybe white women had stopped doing X, Y, and Z for particular reasons. Black women had a whole different set of con uh, concerns and some overlap that they were absolutely active about, but the gaze of history wasn't focused on them, right? So as we do the work of reclaiming that history, what does that do now to our models of, of, of activism and, and movement dynamics? Um, saying that, uh, as the scholarship tries to catch up and we in include things like critical race and intersectionality back into the work, uh, it allows us the tools to now see these, these moments differently, right? I, I often ponder what does an environmental movement look like if we center black women? What does a PTA movement look like if we center black women? Um, and there's people who are doing that work, right? Um, so I don't want to discount that. But oftentimes the way that the field policed, the literally the police, the scholars out of it, I tend to do, uh, um, make the, 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 the connection in my work that I, I use someone as like Patricia Hill Scholars absolutely as a, as a social movement scholar. He, um, and what does that do to kind of the canon and how does that change how we think around these other subject matters for sure? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then our other question uh, is from Liz Grombach at the IHR, and she said, I'll just read it verbatim. Okay. Um, at the IHR and ASU, we have a mission to look at the histories and stories of the past to analyze the present and, present and create better futures. Your scholarship seems to prove that this movement and this work is necessary to sustain social movements. Could you talk more about the importance of humanities in a time when critical race studies is at risk? Wow, Liz, really? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Another softball question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that I'm a, I, I, I'm a interdisciplinary scholar, that uh, my training, uh, my master's is in sociology, my PhD is in American studies, and I do subscribe to this, right? There is an importance of history, but I also challenge the way that we construct our disciplines to be in such isolation. You know, the, the conversations that we have in back rooms is absolutely related to, we see a paper that's produced in one department that absolutely a scholar in our department has already written that, and like, why are they not citing each other and that kind of thing? Like, that's... As, as people who are thinking around their own employment and on you know their own kind of social positioning, that's one argument to have. But I also think around like what disservices are we doing to our communities by doing that, right? What progress could we have made already if we got out of our own issues, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely, I think it's important for humanities to continue to do this work. But I also think it's important for uh, for the historian to show up to the sociology conference to challenge how people are thinking around X, Y, and Z. That uh, that uh, that uh, faculty hired in women's studies shows up to everybody else's departments to challenge them on how they're thinking on X, Y, and Z. And the people in disciplinary positions actually do the work of listening and hearing and including uh, different voices, um, we're all capable enough to get beyond the kind of the methodological barriers, right? So like, how do we move beyond that and get to the subject matter at hand? Um, sorry, I'm reading the, the Q&A questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I have another question. Does it mean that part of sustaining contemporary movements is about, oh, sorry, the, sort of a two-part question. So mm -hmm. thinking about, this is going back to your idea that what sort of killed the, I'm sorry, I actually, um, Jamal, can you retype your, your question? Because I'm not quite sure what specifically you were asking it in reference to. Um, and so I'm having trouble kind of. Oh, what do I? But I'll just ask this. Do you think that platforms such as podcasting, Amazon, add to the sustainability of movements like uh, Black Lives Matter? Um, yes, I think so, right? I think there is always the element of being able to control your own uh, narrative, um, controlling a level of literacy. Uh, in this space, right? I see, I see podcasts serving very much in the same role that I saw uh, uh, Black, uh, the Black Panther organization having their own pamphlets and having their own newsletters, right? That there was always kind of been this freedom radio where people were able to control uh, what they wanted to, to say and their agendas. I absolutely think that's part of it. But also, I think, and I think about your work, Sarah, on kind of the movement from one space to the other but also like what that does to the space that we're leaving, right? That there has to be this a little bit of, um, of a mm, kind of a politics of failure, right? There are moments where it's absolutely necessary for the organization to die uh, as kind of an institutional branding, right? That that needs to die, but that doesn't mean that the activists themselves stop being activists. If, uh, you know, if, if, uh, Opal Tometi says that Black Lives Matter as an organization has died. That doesn't mean that the other seven organizations that she's either founded or sits on the board of isn't still doing that work, right? So there's a way that uh, letting these organizations go through a natural decline keeps it from being co-opted in ways that become problematic to the agenda. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I apologize for that confusion. The question yeah. was asked in two different parts and just like yes. another question came in in between those two parts. It took me a little while. <laughs> um, so um, I have another question here um, that I'll just read it. A black history professor in the 1970s said integration killed black activism. What are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, there's, there's, I would imagine that there's some truth to that, right? That um, certainly we saw the creation of a particular type of black middle class, right? That uh, a level of, uh, 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 I think around uh, people like my father, actually, right, who is a child of the 60s, but also got hired at AT&T and had a, you know, had a, uh, as AT&T kind of hired a lot of uh, black men in the Cleveland area. Um, certainly that integration happened and certainly it put a lot of people in position where they had something to lose and had to think uh, in particular how they, uh, what they decided they wanted to risk and also certainly change uh, some of their belief systems, right? So that that is something that happened. But I don't think that's, you know, the the one to one this happened, therefore this other thing happened. I think you also have to put this in conversation with how Reagan killed this movement, right? You have to put this in conversation with how uh, the state infiltrated these organizations, something that I'm very much worried about as we think around the digital and on a global scale on how, uh, you know, governmental entities, uh, both allies and, and kind of enemies of the state alike are both trying to influence uh, this movement because they know if they can get a certain percentage of people to sit down or to activate in particular ways that it has a great uh, influence on, on this election coming up. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we really appreciate your time and, and you being here with us, and we appreciate everybody who tuned in. I need to turn it back over to Liz Grombach uh, to wrap us up. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah, for co-hosting with IHR. And Kevin, thank you for sharing your scholarship and your thoughts and your innovative methodologies. And thank you for answering my question. I know especially like I'm going to be doing the work of listening and hearing and including voices. And I wrote that down really, really fast, but I'm excited to go back to this and the video that will be archived on YouTube for anyone that would like to go back to this conversation as well. For those watching, the series will continue on October 28th with Leanne Simpson, who will be presenting on her book, As We Have Always Done, and Place-Based Indigenous Alternatives to the Destructive Logics of the Settler Colonial State. I hope you'll also mark your calendars for the final event in our series, a conversation with Julian Lim and C. Pam Zhang on November 20th. So thank you again. Thank you to our speaker. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to the entire Institute for Humanities community for kind of showing up and, and being here today. <laughs>